about that later. Um, my name is Morgan Mill. I'm going to be telling you about um, my master's research today about phylogenomic analysis of color pattern evolution in poison frogs, I'm working on with Jason Brown at Southern Illinois University. Uh, so we all know poison frogs, very charismatic group of amphibians. Um, they are toxic, uh, which is the reason for their colorful uh, morning coloration. Uh, they get this from chemical defenses in their skin that they sequester um, from their prey items. Uh, so because they're toxic um, and they're giving off this aposomatic morning coloration, evolutionarily, uh, we would expect them to get be advantageous from giving off a single morning coloration across lineages. Uh, presumably, the single warning coloration um, would provide a single warning to predators um, that would encounter them more often in the wild if we see it across more lineages. So if we see this convergence of phenotype across lineages, um, presumably it would be better for the frogs um, because it would accelerate predator learning if they're running into them more often. Um, this is the idea of the advantages of a convergent phenotype. So a great example that we see of this is in malaria and mimicry and immunofinal poison frogs. Um, for example, at the Baradero site um, in Peru, we have three different species of Bernito Maya frogs is existing in Sympatry and two different mimetic pairings. Uh, so this would be an example of convergence. Uh, however, this isn't the case uh, that we see for a lot of species of poison frogs. There are many examples across genera, uh, such as Ophaga familio, um, Dendrobates pictorius, um, and Bernito Maya imitator, where we see these vast amounts of intraspecific variation. Uh, so we don't think that aposematism convergence is the only evolutionary pressure at play here. Uh, this leads us to suspect a second hypothesis that female mate choice might be playing a role in the diversification of poison frog phenotype. Uh, sexual selection, females choosing increasingly more brilliant colored males uh, would lead to uh, diversifying phenotypes as opposed to convergent phenotypes. So the genus that I'm going to be talking to you guys specifically about today is the Renito Maya poison frogs. Uh, there's about 16 described species in this group, um, and they range across the Amazon. And this is a really, really interesting group to address questions of phenotypic evolution in, because even though they're a relatively small group, they're only about 11 million years old, uh, we still see this immense diversity across the group in parental care type. Uh, we see biparental care and single parental care. Uh, we see uh, promiscuous species uh, and other examples of diverse um, mating strategies here across a very small group. Uh, we also see a great diversity in range size. So we can see some of these species are restricted to pretty narrow areas within Peru, whereas others of them range across Brazil and even over French Guiana. Uh, so it's interesting uh, the patterns that might be exerting pressures in this group to see these diverse range sizes. Uh, and lastly, of course, we see a lot of diverse color and pattern within this group. So it makes it very interesting to address questions of phenotypic evolution. So like I said, I'll be talking about my master's research as uh, illustrated by this photorealistic portrait of me in the near future, in the corner. Uh, and the folks slide that I'm fo focusing on for my master's research are twofold. So first of all, how has phenotype evolved in Renito Maya specifically with in regard to color pattern? And also, which geographic regions are under the greatest mimetic selection? We're really interested in addressing uh, this question from a spatial context. Uh, so in order to address these questions, we'll first clarify evolutionary relationships among the species uh, and reconstruct uh, what we believe to be the ancestral patterns. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about um, creating species distribution models to address our second focus, um, and specifically uh, parsing our species distribution models into more specific distribution models. And then briefly at the end, I'll wrap it up with uh, where I envision this project going, um, including estimating uh, evolutionary rates and also creating spatial predictions of malaria. So I'll be mostly focusing on this first two. Um, I generated the first genomic phylogeny of the Renita Maya poison frog group, um, and then we'll get into reconstruction of ancestral pattern. Uh, so my, for my uh, phylogenetic methods, uh, we had 63 individuals sampled uh, in our phylogeny, and they represent uh, the great diversity across the group. So morphological diversity in terms of uh, we have each color morph represented for each species, as well as genetic diversity and geographic diversity um, in terms of those species that have much wider ranges. Uh, we used ultra-conserved elements as a genomic marker. We used about 1,500 loci with 26,000 parsimony informative sites. Uh, maximum likelihood analysis and IQ tree. 
And then for my ancestral character estimation, I used the eight package in R. Uh, specifically, we used a discrete character evolution maximum likelihood estimation. And after some model selection, I went with a symmetrical model of um, character transition rates. Uh, so to categorize color pattern, um, we came up with four categories, discrete categories that capture the variation within this group. Uh, so we have the spotted color morph, uh, striped color morph, uh, bright blotch, which is characterized by lack of pigmentation, and abandoned color morph. So here are some results. Um, this is just my phylogeny that came out of IQ tree. Um, the species are dictated by the boxes and also within the brackets there. And then here I have superimposed the phenotypes on top of the phylogeny. So we have a key here on the side uh, so you know which tip state is represented to which phenotype. So what I really want you to get a look at here is just uh, how many polytypic species there are in this group. So for example, if we look up near the top to Renina Maya imitator, we can see that there is um, a banded morph, a spotted morph, and a striped morph. So uh, that group has uh, many morphs within it, but also just nearby, we see Yadorikola, Raninomaya, Fredo Batata, Cyano Batata, which are all simply striped. Those are monotypic morphs per pattern. Uh, but if we look at <coughs> the phylogeny, we see other examples like Raninomaya and Sonica, is both bright blush and uh, striped. Uh, Variopolis, there's a striped morph and a spotted morph. Whereas we have amino my deflory, that's just striped. So we do have many species that are polytypic, but we also have a lot of monotypic species. Um, and also each color pattern has evolved multiple times throughout the phylogeny. Um, like I noted before, uh, you see a spotted phenotype down here in Variabas, but we also see it originating up here in the Bansolini group, um, as well as bright blotching up in the Sorensis group, but also down in Benedicta. We see these color patterns emerging in multiple places in the phylogeny. So if we reconstruct the ancestral uh, patterns, uh, we find that uh, most likely the common answer probably had a striped phenotype, uh, but also a lot of the transitions to other color pattern states are happening further down the phylogeny closer to the tips. And if we count through here, there's about four origins of spots, six origins of the bright blotching, three origins of bands, um, and at least one reversal back to stripes down here in our fantastic right at the very bottom. It's at the bottom. Um, at least once. But what I really want you to get from this is that color pattern seems to be a highly labile trait in this group of organisms. The variation that we see does not appear to be the result of a transition um, that happened further back and then was highly conserved. A lot of these um, changes seem to be happening uh, quite rapidly and happening many times in the tree. Alright, so what have we done so far? Uh, we created a genomic phylogeny to anchor the rest of our analyses, and we reconstructed ancestral color pattern to find that color is probably a highly labile trait in this group. So I want to move on to talk a little bit about where we're going with our species distribution models to address uh, the spatial context of evolution in this trait. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar, species distribution models, also known as ecological niche modeling, is a way of modeling habitat suitability in a group. Um, in this image here, the, uh, the areas of the higher heat map indicate higher areas of habitat suitability. Uh, we do our modeling in Maxent, which is a machine learning method, um, and this is essentially a means of taking climate data and occurrence data to generate a model that can tell us um, where these species have suitable habitat areas. So what we would like to do, um, using Bernina Maya Imitator as an example here, uh, we have this map of occurrence data from Renina Maya Imitator. Um, and then here in this slide, you can see how we've parsed that map apart. So you can see that the straight, the straight morph is up near the north, the spotted morph to the west, and the banded to the south. So we have this three color morphs we were talking about earlier. And what we plan to do is create a species level model of the group and then parse that apart post modeling into morph specific maps in SDM toolbox. So for example, um, we can see here the species model is on the right, the species SDM, and then parsed apart into just for the striped morph is on the left. Uh, so we can see uh, the areas that are probably most highly suitable for the striped morph over here. And then the spot changes a little bit, and then we have the banded one as well. So what we would like to do is 
create species distribution models for every species and parse them apart into the different morphs for every species within this group. Uh, this is still a work in progress. This is the culmination of efforts from the first year of my master's, so this effort is ongoing. But what I would really like to share with you all is where I see this going once we've acquired all of these species distribution maps. So, coming soon to theaters near you, uh, I hope to estimate rates of phylogenetic uh, rates of evolution for each species morph along each branch of the lineage, and combine those with the species distribution maps for each morph uh, to create maps of spatial um, predictions of malaria. <coughs> So what we envision, um, we would like to combine each of the species distribution maps, say for every one of the striped morphs. Here we have an example of that. Two of the striped morphs and the three dots represent the rest of the striped morphs. If we combine all of our species distribution models, our morph distribution models together, we can get an, an idea of where all of these morphs are overlapping in their ranges. But if we can weight those models by the rates of evolutionary change, we can also see uh, which areas of overlap are overlapping with the lineages that are evolving at the fastest rates. And that can give us an index of where we are most likely to see malaria mimicry occurring and these overlapping ranges with the most uh, the lineages that are evolving the fastest. So uh, with that, I would really like to thank the Brown Lab, Dr. Evan uh, the Department of Zoology for funding my trip to evolution this summer, and also my graduate committee, and I will take whatever questions you have. Uh, there is evidence for hybridization um, within those, uh, between those.